Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series is on the seasons of life. This is lesson number three in that series entitled, Preparing for Change. Uh, I think we all know that life is full of changes. This is the lesson for April 20 of 2019. And as usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we know that we live in a world that's constantly in change. Change is happening all around us. We have programs on television that emphasize news, and the news is, I mean, if it happened yesterday, it's not news anymore. Everything is changing. And so help us to understand how we can best adapt our lives to the changes which are most important. And help us in this lesson that we may think about those things and come up with some possible solutions is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I don't have to tell any of you out there in the audience that our world is full of changes. Uh, changes everywhere. Television news, as you know, is, as we already mentioned, uh, is just constantly changing. You, you never know from one minute to the next what's going to be the news. So on this le in this lesson, we're going to focus on four major areas of change that happen in our lives. Marriage, children, old age, and death. And these are changes that we, most all of us, get involved in in one way or another. So we need to organize ourselves. We need to prepare, hopefully knowledgeably, for each of these changes. So let's talk about how they might affect us. The Bible is full of good, righteous, and bad or sinful experiences of its heroes. It does not pretend that we have no problems. This makes it absolutely unique in the records of ancient history. There should be no question in our minds about our true status. So let's just be honest there. Carrie, I think you know something, have something about that. Yes, I'm going to quote Romans 3.23. It comes from the Good News translation of the Bible. Everyone has sinned as in, and is far away from God's saving presence. Okay, so 1 Corinthians 10, 1 to 13, uh, talks about a lot of these changes, and I'm going to just read that for us. I want you to remember, my brothers and sisters, what happened to our ancestors who followed Moses. They were all under the protection of the cloud, all passed safely through the Red Sea. In the cloud and in the sea, they were all baptized as followers of Moses. All ate the same spiritual bread and drank the same spiritual drink. They drank from the spiritual rock that went with them, and that rock was Christ himself. But even then, God was not pleased with most of them, and so their dead bodies were scattered over the desert. And of course, you understand what that was all about. Now, all this is an example for us to warn us not to desire evil things as they did, nor to worship idols as some of them did. As the scripture says, the people sat down to feast, which turned into an orgy of drinking and sex. We not, must not be guilty of sexual immorality as some of them were. And in one day, 23,000 of them fell dead. We must not put the Lord to the test as some of them did and they were killed by snakes. We must not complain as some of them did and they were restore, destroyed by the angel of death. Wow. Well, you know, if you've read the book of Numbers any time recently, uh, especially the book of Numbers, about these experiences and what happened. Um, and why did they happen? Why did they happen that way? Uh, were these people prepared to change or were they so stuck in the rut from their experiences in Egypt that they just couldn't change? Well, how are we supposed to deal with change? Uh, that's probably the first question we really need to ask. Are we faithful and firm to the principles that God has laid down? And Jackie, I think you have some words about that. The greatest want of the world is the want of men, men who will not be bought or sold, men who in their inmost souls are true and honest, men who do not fear to call sin by its right name, men whose conscience is as true to duty as the needle is to the pole, men who will stand for the right though the heavens fall. Wow. Uh, you, the King's Herald sang, a song, sang that in a song. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it was the King's Herald, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. I think it was 
their composer that one of their one of the quartet that put, that actually put it to music. Well, surely those words are as true today as they were long ago. You know the stories. We're not going to have time with these, but Acts five one to ten, Genesis sixteen one and two and five and six, and Matthew twenty are the stories of Ananias and Sapphira. And what did they try to do? Lie. They tried to lie to God and to Peter. Peter yes. Sarah or Sarai was not willing to wait patiently on God and recommended Hagar to be a second wife to Abram or Abraham. And we know what the consequences of that are. We're still living with the consequences of that. James and John tried to manipulate their way into the best positions in the upcoming kingdom, which they believed would take place almost immediately. I mean, it was, they, they were sure that maybe ne by next week there would be set up the kingdom and Jesus would be the new king. But it never happened. They wanted to race ahead of God. None of those approaches are the right way. It's incredibly difficult for us human beings to be patient and wait for God, but that's what we need to do. And we need, of course, we need to be reasonably sure that we're waiting for what God really wants and not for something that we want. Well, okay, so let's get down to major changes in life. What happens when you get married? Well, of course, the model marriage for all time was probably the marriage of Adam and Eve. And fortunately, Adam had it pretty easy. <laughs> it wasn't too difficult to figure out what, which wife to marry, was it? Um, and we, we, it was given clear instructions right there. And I wonder if Adam and Eve wondered what, Je what God was talking about when he said you need to leave your father and mother. Maybe he didn't say it at that time. <laughs> Maybe he didn't say it at that time? Possibly. It's repeated. That, that admonition must be so important that it's repeated three times in the New Testament. Actually, four times. Genesis, well, the Genesis 2 was original, then Matthew 19, Mark 10, and Ephesians 5. So why is it so important for a man to leave his father and mother to cling to his wife? Well... We usually have families somewhere along the line, and it would yeah. increase the population. Okay. And remember that in those days, it was sort of natural for the new couple just to move in and become a part of the parents' family, and then there was often conflict between, okay, what, does the, what do the parents want and what does the young couple want? And God says, it's better for you to move at least a little ways away, so you're at least semi-independent. Uh, we're not trying to recommend a complete separation from the advice of the parents, but we need to be a little bit separate anyway. Um, of course, it's always wonderful to have the grandparents around when you, got, when you have children, and they're usually very happy about it. Well, I think that a, a young man in his home gets used to knowing how to work his mother. I see. Uh-huh. Uh, that, and the so there's a very special bond beyond, between a mother and her son. Mm -hmm. Well, when he leaves the house and takes a new wife, mm -hmm. if she isn't the number one mm -hmm. in his life, it will cause untold distress in his family. That's true. He, and so as a mom, I just know that that's, go, that's supposed to happen. Mm -hmm. And it's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Well, we, we all know about all kinds of stories that are told about mother-in-laws, don't we? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I fortunately had a wonderful mother-in-law who we invited to come and stay with us when we were in Africa, and she came out, mm -hmm. helped take care of the kids, and teach people, and she just did all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. So I was very fortunate in that respect. Well, one of the guiding points for people at all points in life, and not just when they get married, but at all points in life, is found in 1 Corinthians 13. And we all know that that's the love chapter, but especially verses 4 to 8, and I'll read that. Love is patient and kind, is not jealous or conceited or proud. Love is not ill-mannered or selfish or irritable. Love does not keep a record of wrongs. Love is not happy with evil, but is happy with the truth. Love never gives up, and its faith, hope, and patience never fail. Love is eternal. There are inspired messages, but they are temporary. There are gifts of speaking in strange tongues, but they will cease. There is knowledge, but it will pass. Okay, so that's pretty clear. And of course, Galatians 5, 22 and 23, that talk about the fruits of the Spirit. 
Look at those. But the Spirit produces love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, humility, and self-control. There is no law against such things as these. That sounds good enough, doesn't it? Well, we know that those passages aren't particularly addressed, aren't specifically addressed to married couples or couples getting ready to marry, but just think about how different our world would be if every couple um, had prepared with those kind of traits before they got married. Wow. So how many of us come even close to those ideals before we get married? We think we are. We think we're that way and we think we're, we're ready. Mm -hmm. And then marriage happens and then one day you wake up and you're not that way at all. <laughs> I think it depends a little bit on how old you are when you marry. Yeah, it does. Yeah. You're a little bit less starry-eyed and as you get older. Well, since my wife isn't here today, I guess I can say that <laughs> I never really thought that I was perfect. Mm -hmm. oh. you know, I, I don't let her know that. But. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, my wife still gives me a bad time about the fact that uh, I had a list. I had, one of, I had one of these lists. And she did pretty well on my list. But she always snickers a little bit and says, you know, you had that list and so. But how many of us make lists for ourselves before we get married? Well, I thought mm. that's the list you were talking about. No, <laughs> it isn't. You were talking about a list for her? I was talking about a list for her. Oh, my. Well, and how many people, when they get married, are thinking about how they, how, how this partner is going to make them happy as opposed to how they can make their partner happy? I don't know. That's probably not quite so often. Often before getting married, young men and young women make lists. We mentioned that. Uh, Proverbs offers a lot of advice for young men, particularly. Uh, Proverbs 24, 30 to 34, and 22, 24, even 2 Corinthians 6. And Proverbs, again, 11, 14, and 3, 5, and 6. Um, there's so many references to places in the Bible and these lessons, we'd never have a chance to read all of them. Let me look at the one at 1 Corinthians. Do not try to work together as, une as equals with unbelievers, for it cannot be done. How can right and wrong be partners? How can light and darkness live together? How can Christ and the devil agree? What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? How can God's temple come to terms with pagan idols? For we are the temple of the living God, as God himself has said, I will make my home with my people and live among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. That's 2 Corinthians, by the way, not 1st. I'm sorry, thank you. 2 Corinthians 6. Yeah. Well, here's another option. What if every young man, before getting married, insisted that his wife meet all the criteria that are mentioned in Proverbs 31, verses 10 to 31? We don't have time to read all that, but yeah, this is a woman beyond belief. I mean, she's buying and selling properties, and she's getting up early and working late and making clothes for all her family and everybody's warm and has a perfect cooking record and on and on and on. <laughs> Would anyone get married? Wouldn't. Probably nobody. <laughs> a lot fewer marriages anyway. And the population of our world would probably decline dramatically. <laughs> but we should at least determine whether or not that favored person is a few things. Ambitious, willing to work, one that does not have a hot and violent temper, that would be a good idea. Three, a faithful Christian committed to the ideals that God has set down for us. And four, willing to accept and follow wise counsel. And I don't think it's talking about wise counsel from you. <laughs> Only. I, we think, need. I think the ambitious and willing to work, that was all right. They were in a, a, an agrarian society way back, certainly after the fall. Now, it's changed somewhat. Mm -hmm. uh, wife yeah. usually does a lot with the baby, but most of us have a wife that's working. Otherwise, you don't get along too well these yeah. days. I well, think that's a huge issue. Yeah. yeah. The women are exhausted just like the men when they get yeah. home. And all of that is because of what? We think we need more and more and more things. We need bigger houses. We need fancier cars. We need... More and more and more money. Well, many of us 
know at least a few examples of what we would regard as fairly good marriages. What do you think makes them good? Can you think of a marriage? Dennis is my favorite husband. Okay. That's there what you. makes it so good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, what other things? Respect for each other. Uh -huh. mm. All the time, come thick and thin. Mm. My mother used to say to me, don't, don't come to me for support. If your wife comes to me tell her, telling her that she, I wasn't pulling my weight, she said, I won't listen. Good mom. <laughs> Excellent yeah. mom. I never forgot it. Yeah, that's yeah. an excellent mom. So we have to have good character and we have to yeah. work at, uh, at marriage. We mm -hmm. have to yeah. give more than 50%. Yes. There's a story told about a young couple that were getting married and the pastor of the church was a young guy himself. And so they went to, he, the, the husband to be, the husband to be went to the pastor. And the pastor says, well, let me make advice. Let me give you some advice. He says, if you, get a, if you, if you think you're going to get in a disagreement with your wife, before you start arguing with her, go out and walk around the block. He says, okay, I'll, I'll try that. So many years later, the pastor was old and gray, and so were the couple old and gray, and, and uh, the wife died. And so the pastor asked the man, well, uh, how was it? You know, the marriage all these years, and you're look, still looking pretty healthy and so forth, and your wife's dead. He says, well, I guess Pastor was all that outdoor living. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, 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 oh. <laughs> oh yeah. So I hope that isn't the case for, the, for that reason anyway. Well, soon after getting married, of course, there comes the next big challenge, and that challenge is what about children? Well, in ancient times, Carrie's already sort of hinted at this, and so has Jackie, um, people lived on farms. And every child was a blessing because you got another hand to take care of the farm, to do the plowing and the hoeing and the weeding and the, all this rest kind of stuff, or just help mom in the kitchen to feed a whole work crew, you know. Uh, my grandma, you know, when, when the whole crew would come over to, to feed, I mean, to, to work, to harvest the fields and so forth like this, and they would all come in. Here's this, every, every meal, basically a huge crew. You were expected to provide, I mean, they've been working hard, so you were expected to give them a, a uh, hearty meal. So, well, what about today when we don't live like that anymore? They do in parts of the world. There, That's they the do. Thing. India or Africa, some of those places. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, what? What do you think God had in mind when He gave us children? Bring He's too sure. No, it's the way if you have offspring, you've obvious, obviously got to teach them respect for authority, be it mother and father. Or, and if you don't instill a lot of what we take for granted often, mm -hmm. they learn it in childhood. It's very important. I, would, I believe that the things we learn from living with the spouse and things we learn as trying to educate our children are probably two of the most important ways that we learn about God. I mean, think of God's challenge of trying to deal with us as His children. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So how do you prepare for a potential child? So are, are you saying that we're kind of like two-year-olds? Thank you Compared for that, to God? <laughs> Is, does God uh, deal with us like maybe we deal with two-year-olds? Oh. Sometimes, say, sometimes it's like do that. This? Not give reasons, but God gives us reasons. Well, let's, let, there were some people born in the Bible, and their parents, before they were born, were given very specific instructions about how they were to be raised, or even pre, you know, before their birth, what was supposed to happen. Can you remember someone like that? Can you name one? Well, Samuel. Had, what? Uh, Samuel had. Okay, Samuel. Mother Hannah had very much instruction. And okay. Anybody else? Mr. Muscles wasn't Mr. supposed to have his hair cut. Samson. Yeah, well, and yeah. not only that, his mom wasn't supposed to drink any alcohol and no. or anything like that before, yep. before he was born. Yep. What about John the Baptist? Yes. Zechariah was given some pretty specific instructions, wasn't he? Yes. And what about Mary? Oh, yeah. The mother of Jesus. Yes. So here's four people 
Um, there were very unusual people, very special people. God went to extraordinary lengths to make sure those mothers provided the very best possible intrauterine environment for their children and in turn provided the best possible upbringing for their sons. So why do you think God um, chose those particular sets of parents to do the work he needed to have done in each case? How old was Mary when she teenager became a, a, a mother? Probably a teenager. Not only that, they were related to John the Baptist folks. Probably. Yeah. Where did they live? Where did Mary live? Oh, with the... With you could the say in the slums. In Nazareth. Yeah. In Nazareth, okay. Well, is that the best possible place you could think of to raise it? I mean, God could have sent his son to be born anywhere. He could have been in the home of Herod or the home of some other king. He could have been born to the high priest. He could have, I mean, he chooses, he chooses a teenage girl living in a despised city. Is that, you think that's what you would do if you were God? You wanted the right place to raise your son? Considering how bad Samson turned out, <laughs> yes. you know, it, it's a good thing that he, that his mother, <laughs> gave him as good an environment as he did have. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it has been proven repeatedly that the physical, mental, social, and spiritual health of the mother, during her pregnancy especially, has many very important effects on a child's. So why do you think God chose an unmarried teenage woman, we've already met, talking about, talked about this, living in the despised city of Nazareth to be the mother of his son? Wow. You think that was the best place for Jesus to grow up? See, that's where we have to let go of what we think because God knows things and knows everything. He has all the wisdom, all the understanding. And so what he chooses is best. When we try and get our, our ideas and set forth our itinerary, mm -hmm. our list, um, we get in the way of what God is doing rather than submitting to him and letting God work. Well, think about it. Four, three of those, or well, actually four, really, honestly, of those people ended up being prophets and leaders of the nation in one way or another. One of them was the forerunner of the Messiah, and one was the Messiah. Think about the implications of that. Gordon, I think you have some words about that. Ellen White for Ministry of Healing, page 372. The well-being of the child will be affected by the habits of the mother. Her appetites and passions are to be controlled by principle. There is something for her to shun, something for her to work against, if she fulfills God's purpose for her in giving her a child. If before the birth of her child she is self-indulgent, if she is selfish, impatient, and exacting, these traits will be reflected in the disposition of the child. Thus, many children have received as a birthright almost unconquerable tendencies to evil. Wow. Mm. What do we call that now in modern parlance? What kind of influence is that? Epigenetic? Yeah. Some people call that. Think well, the fetal alcohol syndrome and so on. Yeah, well, that's, that's something more than the just drug, epi epigenetic. Drug syndrome. Well, I think that feeds back to what we were just on the edge of about Christ. There was no pretense of wealth or anything there. Yeah. And we do know that he could read. So somewhere there was something going on that we don't seem to know. And uh, he got a good start that way. Yeah. Well, newer research shows that even before a woman gets pregnant, she needs to make sure that her nutrition is as good as possible. For example, a vitamin known as folic acid is essential in the development of the sperm from the father and the egg in the developing zygote and the fetus in the mother. That vitamin helps to prevent problems with the development of the spinal cord, which of course is a pretty important part of us, isn't it? So what can we do to prepare for that potential child? Certainly we should try to maximize the healthful conditions of physical, mental, social, and spiritual aspects of our lives. That can be done best through prayer, Bible study, constant dependent on God's guidance for our lives. Okay, so moving on, how do we best prepare for old age? Psalms 9010, 
Seventy years is all we have, eighty years, if we are strong, yet all this, excuse me, all they bring us is trouble and sorrow. Life is soon over and we are gone. From the Good News Bible. That's kind of a, sound like Solomon, <laughs> doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Sound like Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes. Well, the interesting thing is, know that these words are, these words are in a book of, of Psalms, uh, a book of the Psalms, were actually written by Moses. And he began his major work in life at the age of 80. Yeah. <laughs> That's incredible. Apparently, Moses needed 80 years of training and preparation for those years that came after his 80th. 80th. At 120 years of age, it was said of him, Carrie? Moses. And I'm sorry, I'll get that. De okay. that. I was supposed to read that. Deuteronomy 34 7. Moses was 120 years. No, it was you. I'm sorry. Go ahead. It's you. Yeah, Moses it was, was 120 years old when he died. He was as strong as ever, and his eyesight was still good. That comes from the Amazing. Good News Bible. Psalm 71 gives us a lot of advice. We don't have time to read it all. We do not know how old David was when he wrote this psalm, but he talked about three important lessons. Okay, Carrie, I'll let you read that one too. This is divided into, th as we just said, into three sections. Develop a deep personal knowledge of God from his youth. God was his strong refuge and his savior. God is a rock and fortress, his hope and confidence. He speaks of God's mighty deeds, his strength and power, and all the great things he has done. Ultimately, he shouts, O oh God, who is like you? Those daily conversations with God as we study his word and as we pause to reflect on all he does for us will deepen our experience with him. The second section is develop good habits, good nutrition, exercise, water, sunshine, rest, etc. will help us enjoy life longer and better. Take special note as to how the psalmist refers to the habits of trust and hope. The third section, develop a passion for God's mission. The person in Psalm 71 was not looking forward to being idle in his old age. Even in his retirement, he wanted to continue praising God and telling others about him. And that's from the Adult Sabbath School Bible Study, study Guide. Well, are there any advantages to getting older? I once saw a gold Mercedes Benz was driving right in front of me. And you know, people sometimes have mottos around, the, around their license plate. And, it, and the little license plate says, retirement is wonderful, but getting old is for the birds. He used a little more colorful language than that. But <laughs> yeah. So what, are there any advantages of getting old? Have you learned something? I know most of us have been around for a little while. Uh, have we learned some things from getting older? Well, I think, I think it depends a great deal on if you're walking with God or not. Because before the flood, they lived a long, long time, but their hearts were constantly turned to evil. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what good did it do them? Yeah. Well, the longer we live, the more exposure we have to different ideas and new experiences. Maybe that's a benefit. There are the benefits of having grandchildren. I don't know any grandmothers who aren't happy about their grandchildren. And many friends that we develop over the years, every once in a while you have an opportunity. Some of us are getting ready to have the 50th anniversary of our graduation from medical school, getting together with a bunch of old friends. And then there's retirement, which are supposed to be the golden years. Well, <clears throat> can we or should we prepare for death? Or is that something we shouldn't even try to think about? I think that's one of the blessings we have. We do it believing what we do to a large extent. I often wonder about the people that have got no hope. It must be a real worry at times. Yeah. Well, here's what Paul said about it in 1 Corinthians 15, 24 to 26. Then the end will come. Christ will overcome all spiritual rulers, authorities, and powers and will hand over the kingdom, of God, kingdom to God the Father. For Christ must rule until God defeats all enemies and puts them under his feet. The last enemy to be put to death, to be defeated, will be death. The last enemy to be defeated will be death. That'll be nice, huh? Yes. Yeah. 
No matter what happens between now and the second coming of Christ, resurrection or a translation of those who are faithful to him are the guaranteed results of living Christ-like lives. How does that make you feel? Looking forward to it. Yeah. Are we fortunate that we have a clear understanding of what happens beyond the grave? I mean, you, Jackie, already commented, you know, only God knows for sure what's, hap what's beyond the grave. And fortunately for us, it's something that, you know, we're all, we're all going to experience it sooner or later, assuming Jesus doesn't come first. Our understanding of the nature of man and the state of the dead makes things so much easier as we face death. Think of how things change for the disciples after crucifixion weekend. That weekend began with the terrible events of the arrest, the trial, the beatings, the crucifixion of Jesus. And what were they doing when all that was going on? Hiding. Hiding, Hiding behind locked doors in the upper room. So you wonder, we don't even know how many of the disciples saw any part of that. We know John did. He's the only one we know for sure that saw any of that. Peter. And, well, Peter did. He saw at least the beginnings, a little part of it. The trial. Yeah. Um, but when Sunday came and they realized that Jesus was alive and had conquered death, once and for all, they, they became bold even in the face of the Jewish leaders who had arrested them. They were no longer afraid to die. We should have the same hope that sustained them, even though it is likely that all of them, except John, died martyrs' deaths. And if you have the privilege someday of visiting the Holy Land, including not only Palestine and Israel, but if you go over into Turkey where the early, the seven churches are and so forth, you can actually find at least two places where they're quite certain. One, the place where Thomas died, uh, was martyred, and the place where John finally died and was buried. And those places, that's in Ephesus. Well, Thomas, Thomas died in Ephesus? No, Thomas died in, in, in India. Uh, wasn't it? in a place called um, um, Hierapolis. Okay. I mean, uh, that he had gone no. to? He was in India for a time. But yeah, he was, yes. He moved back, huh? Okay. Mm -hmm. No, I'm sorry, it was Philip. It's Philip who died there, not, not Thomas. Okay. Yeah. What would you do if you knew that you had only a few months to live? <laughs> David had some very interesting words to say about that point in his life. Think what you know about the life of David. We know a lot about the life of David, relatively, considering compared to other persons that talk about in the Bible. And you know about the story of his experience with Bathsheba. Everybody knows, seems to know that story. And then what happened? Uh, four of his sons ended up dying as a result of w one way or another of that fiasco. Um, Jackie? I think you have something for us on that. So this is 1 Kings 2, 1 to 4. When David was about to die, he called his son Solomon and gave him his last instructions. My time to die has come. Be confident and determined and do what the Lord your God orders you to do. Obey all his laws and commands as written in the law of Moses so that wherever you go, you may prosper in everything you do. If you obey him, the Lord will keep the promise he made when he told me that my descendants would rule Israel as long as they, are, they were careful to obey his commands faithfully with all their heart and soul. Well, so David realized that it was a conditional prophecy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, think about all we know about David's life, what we don't know. And yet there he was near his death, speaking to Solomon, the second son of his relationship with Uriah's wife. David had learned some very hard lessons from the results of that mistake, but he did give some very good advice to his son Solomon. But how should we feel about the rest of David's advice? Gordon, I think you have something on that. We should be very careful about it. <laughs> this is uh, Good News Bible, 1 Kings 2, 5 through 9, the next verses after what Jackie r read. There is something else. You remember what Joab did to me by killing the two commanders of Israel's armies, Abner son of Ner and Amasa son of Jether. You remember how he murdered them in time of peace in revenge for deaths they had caused in time of war. He killed innocent men 
And now I bear the responsibility for what he did, and I suffer the consequences. You know what you must do. You must not let him die a natural death. That's quite a statement. Mm -hmm. Verse 7, But show kindness to the son of Barzillai from Gilead and take care of them. Because uh, they, let's just interrupt for a second. Barzillai, I think, is actually the correct pronunciation of that name. That was the man who, who took care of David when he was fleeing from Absalom over on the other side of the Jordan. But show kindness to the sons of Barzillai from Gilead and take care of them, because they were kind to me when I was fleeing from your brother Absalom. There is also Shemai, son of Gera, from the town of Again, I'll smear it. Bahurim. Bahurim in Benjamin. He cursed me bitterly the day I went to Men Mahanaim. Mahanaim. Yeah. But when he met me at the River Jordan, I gave him my solemn promise in the name of the Lord that I would not have him killed. But you must not let him go unpunished. You know what to do, and you must see to it that he is put to death. Wow. Great advice, huh? <laughs> seems like he was getting even, huh? Yeah, it does seem like that, doesn't it? <clears throat> and what else happened? What about the banishment of Ab Abiathar and the death of Adonijah? Abiathar was the, was the high priest. But and he, he, he came to the conclusion that probably Absalom was supposed to be the next, uh, going to be the next king. And so when Absalom declared you know, went to Hebron and declared himself to be the next king. Well, what is the high priest supposed to do? He's supposed to support the next king, right? Well, David deposed him because he supported Absalom, which he probably should have been a little wiser than that, but well, that's what happened. He put a different king and a, a different high priest in line, and so a different line came up. And then what about Adonijah? Remember the story of Adonijah? Mm -hmm. Adonijah is one of the other sons of David, a bright young man. He thought maybe he would be the next king when Solomon was chosen because Solomon was younger than he was. And then after it was all done, remember, I guess we should go back for a second. Look at 1 Kings, uh, 1 Kings chapter 1. Back and let's the first, okay, let me get to the beginning of it here. Um, the King David was now a very old man, and although his servants covered him with blankets, he could not keep warm. So officials said to his officials said to him, Your Majesty, let us find a young woman to stay with you and take care of you. She will lie close to you and keep you warm. A search was made all over Israel for a beautiful young woman. Now, to keep you warm, you need a beautiful young woman, right? And in Shunem they found such a woman named Abishag and brought her to the king. She was very beautiful and waited on the king and took care of him, but she did not have intercourse with him. So all her job was just to keep the king warm, take good care of him. And so when, when all this was done and David was gone, Adonijah said, well, maybe I could at least have his, David's hot water bottle. And what did Solomon say? Just because he wanted to marry her, he needs to be killed. His, one, his brother, he killed his brother because he didn't do it himself, but he commanded his brother to be killed because he wanted dad's hot water bottle. There wasn't any self-centeredness in those people, was there? None at all. So they were half-brothers, is that right? Yeah, I'm, I probably, I'm sure they must have been different mothers, yeah. <coughs> yeah. Still. Well. It's in the book. How many of David's final instructions do you think were what God actually wanted? Very few. Yeah. It I seems. just sure he wanted any you of know, this is all so tragic, but I keep going back to Adam and Eve. You said they were the best couple ever, the perfect couple, mm -hmm. and their two sons, yeah. one killed the other. Yeah, and it's like once sin came in, man, things are just—it's a mess. Yeah. Sin was already around, though. Yeah, people. We are a mess. Well, Moses, let's talk about another great person from the Bible, had been told by God that he would not live to cross over the Jordan River and enter the Promised Land. 
So do you, know, do you remember what God did with him? It was because of that mistake he made at Kitty's party. You know what happened there? God says, go out and speak. The first time he was commanded to hit the rock, right, earlier in the experience. But this time back at Kadesh Barnea, God says, just speak to the rock and water will come forth. And Moses got upset and he said, you rebels, do I need to bring water for you out of this rock? Bang, and he hit the rock. And God says, well, what, what, what happened there? What, what was the problem with that? It says, you I broke said, faith with me. Yeah, he misrepresented me. He said, I, I'm doing it. Yeah, he did, I'm doing it. That was part of it. He's, he, he basically misrepresented God. And God says, I'm sorry, that, that's a serious sin. You misrepresented me. Here I have chosen you for a hundred and probably a hundred and some many years, 119 years so far. And you were, you, you've done a pretty good job almost all the way along. And now you did this and misrepresented me before people, so I can't let you cross the, the Jordan River and go into the Promised Land. So what did he? What did? What happened to Moses? Went up the you remember? Went up the mountain and died a little later. He went to the top of that one mountain and, and died. What happened to him when he was up there? Do you remember? The devil said, "Get away! He's mine." Well, that was what happened before that. I think he saw a vision of what was coming, including God, God including showed him Jesus a vision himself. of the whole land, the way it was supposed to be, beautiful and laid out before him. And even then, after that, he God died. He died, and God buried him. And of course, the devil claimed him, but God came a short time later and resurrected him from the dead, and took him to which Canaan? The heavenly the one in Palestine, no, the one in heaven. Now let's see, which would you rather go to? The one up there, or the one down here? <laughs> Do, do I remember that Ellen, Ellen White said that Moses even saw down to the time of Jesus? Or, yes. Yeah, okay. That's correct. Look at Deuteronomy 4, 3 to 14. You reserve, now this is, remember that Deuteronomy consists mostly of three long sermons that Moses made to the children of Israel in that last month of his life while they're, they're, they're camped at the foot of Mount, of, at, in the Jordan Valley, just across from, from uh, Jericho. And here's one of the, some of the words he said, You yourselves saw what the Lord did at Mount Peor. He destroyed everyone who worshipped Baal there, but those who, of you who were faithful to the Lord, your God, are still alive today. 23,000 23, people died because they got involved with Baal worship and, and with the, all those uh, good-looking women, I guess, that came in from Moab and Me, Me, uh, Midian. I have taught you all the laws as the Lord my God told me to do. Obey them in the land that you are about to invade and occupy. Obey them faithfully, and this will show the people of other nations how wise you are. When they hear of all these laws, they will say, What wisdom and understanding this great nation has. No other nation, no matter how great, is a God who is so near when they need him as the Lord our God is to us. He answers us when, whenever we call for help. No other nation, no matter how great, has laws so just as those that I have taught you today. Now that ought to be enough to warm your heart, shouldn't it? Actually, let's, let's, let's finish up. I didn't read the whole way down. Um, be on your guard. Make certain that you do not forget as long as you live that you have been seen, that you, what you have seen with your own eyes. Tell your children and your grandchildren about the day you stood in the presence of the Lord your God at Mount Sinai. When he said to me, assemble the people, I want them to hear what I have to say so that they will learn to obey me as long as they live and so that they will teach their children to do the same. Tell your children how you went and stood at the foot of the mountain, which was covered with thick clouds of dark smoke and fire blazing up to the sky. Tell them how the Lord spoke to you from the fire, how you heard him speaking but did not see him in any form at all, but he told you what you must do to keep the covenant he made with you. You must obey the Ten Commandments, which he wrote on two stone tablets. The Lord told me to teach you all the laws that you are to obey in the land that you're about to invade and occupy. That's pretty clear instructions. What happened to those 23,000 men in the plains of Moab? Died. They died? Why did they die? I don't remember. I remember the, the Balaam. Oh, Balaam said to Balak, Slaves. the king, he said, the only way you're going to be able to conquer these Israelites is if you get them to sin. So what did Balak do? 
He sent all the good-looking ladies down there with all their enchantments and so forth like that, and 23,000 men got involved with those people and died. Do you think they died of an infectious disease, or did God miraculously kill them, or...? I don't think it was an infectious disease. I don't think they waited that long. What a marvelous relationship the children of Israel had the opportunity of having with their, they had the opportunity of having, notice they didn't have it, but they had the opportunity of having with an all-seeing, all-knowing, all-powerful God. And what about us? God clearly instructed them to share that knowledge with generations um, to come and people of other nations. So think about us. How blessed are we as Seventh-day Adventists who we're at the point at where we are in this point of human history. No other generation has been blessed with so much truth available to them. What are we doing with all that truth? How, much of us, how many of us have ever uh, read even a major portion of it? Jim, I think you've got something on that. The crime that brought the judgments of God upon Israel was that of licentiousness. The forwardness of women to entrap souls did not end at Baal Peor. Ellen White, Review and Herald, May 17, 1887. Yeah, she was in the process of putting together the story of the great controversy all the way through in her uh, series of books there. So who was mainly at fault at Baal Peor? Was it the women of Moab and Midian or was it the men of Israel? Yes. <laughs> That's the right answer. <laughs> <laughs> there are clearly two ways to look, uh, look into the future. One can be prepared or one can be unprepared. Which sounds better? Prepared. We've already noted that living healthy, God-fearing lives is the best way to prepare for each, each of those life changes. Uh, Carrie, I think you've got something on that. This uh, comes from uh, the state of U.S. health. It turns out that there is one particular risk factor topping the charts for both death and disability. Let that sink in for a moment. The same risk factor related to most deaths in the U.S. and the most years lost because of disability and death are the same. Any guesses? One might think the number one risk factor was alcohol, tobacco smoking, being overweight, or being inactive. Good guesses, but wrong ones. The number one risk factor is what we put in our mouths every day. Mm -hmm. It is the food we eat. Don't be fooled by food labeled organic, vegan, gluten-free, vegetarian, natural, etc. There is now a consensus among a number of health professionals that a diet consisting of primarily whole, unrefined plant foods such as grains, beans, fruits, and vegetables substantially reduces one's risk for numerous common diseases. Such luminaries in preventive health as called will be Esselton Jr., T. Colin Campbell, Dean Ornish, and John A. McDougall are in agreement with the above assessment on the role of diet on health. Neil Barnard and Michael Grieger are recent advocates as well. Each of these men holds medical degrees or PhD in nutrition. For first information, for further rather information, their presence is ubiquitous on the internet. So what do you? Well, hold on a second. I skipped over one place that I wanted to read. It's a really important one. So let's back up a couple of paragraphs here. I'm not doing so well today. The Bible is rare among ancient li literature in that it does not gloss over the failures of its heroes nor exaggerate their successes. The lesson authors highlight the fact that scripture portrays life in an uncensored fashion. The mistakes of others are in the Bible for all to see and if taken seriously, serve as warning beacons. In addition, the testimonies of people's lives all around us confirm the, the truthfulness and timeliness of Bible principles. The following stories are two of thousands of stories that we could all share that show the folly of not preparing for old age and death in a way that glorifies the giver of life. And uh, we don't have time to look at those stories, but uh, we all know there are some people who are very well prepared for old age and some who are not. Most of us have had to face the fact that someone close to us or even related to us has died. It makes us want to think about what we can do about that eventuality in our lives. 
A recent report lists 17 risk factors related to death and disability, and Carrie has already talked to us about that. It's what we eat is the biggest single risk factor for how we're get, what happens to us when we get old. And Jackie, I think you have some words from Ellen White that, that expounds on that. Ellen White, ahead of her time as usual, stated more than 100 years ago that, and then this is the quote, grains, fruits, nuts, and vegetables constitute the diet chosen for us by our Creator. These foods, prepared in as simple and natural a manner as possible, are the most healthful and nourishing. They impart a strength, a power of endurance, and a vigor of intellect that are not afforded by a more complex and stimulating diet. Ministry of Healing, page 296. Wow. We usually don't like to be told what we can eat or what we should eat. Some have even said, I'd rather eat what I want and die happy. But people eat what they want often do not die happy. Frequently, they end up with long, drawn-out, debilitating diseases such as diabetes, strokes, heart disease, or even kidney failure. Doesn't sound like fun to me. Dr. Kim Williams, president of the American College of Cardiology, chooses to live a healthy life, avoiding alcohol, cigarettes, and all animal products. He said, I don't mind dying, but I just don't want it to be, it to be my fault. In a thing called Heal Thyself, the University of Chicago Magazine. But none of us can predict exactly how we will die. It could be suddenly and tragically as in an automobile accident, or it could be a long drawn out fight with cancer or kidney failure. The famous journalist Malcolm Muggeridge, who ended up living most of his life in not a very healthy way, later came to Christ. What follows are his concluding words. Gordon, I think that's yours. I may, I suppose, regard myself as a relatively successful man. People occasionally stare at me in the streets. That's fame. I can e fairly easily earn enough money to qualify for admission to the higher slopes of the Internal Revenue Service. <laughs> like that. That's success. <laughs> Furnished with money and a little fame, even the elderly, if they care to, may, may partake of friendly diversions. That's pleasure. It might happen once in a while that something I said or wrote was sufficiently heated for me to persuade myself that it represented a serious impact on our time. That's fulfillment. Yet I say to you, and I beg you to believe me, multiply these tiny triumphs by millions, add them, up, add them all up together, and they are nothing, less than nothing. Indeed, a positive impediment measured against one drop of the living water Christ offers to the spiritually thirsty, irrespective of who or what they are. Wow. Amen. That's Amen. Wow. Ravi Zacharias in Can Man Live Without God? Well, what about that? We probably all know of elderly people in their 70s or 80s who are still climbing mountains. I'm one of those. We probably also know of others in that age group who are much younger that who are bedridden or can hardly climb a flight of stairs. And I, I hear about this kind of stuff in, as I see patients almost every day. What's the difference? Why are some people climbing mountains and other people can't climb the stairs? What is not recognized by many is that one can add up to 10 years of life by eating a healthy diet, suggested, as we mentioned earlier, by Ellen White, and avoiding the bad habits so common in our world today. This has been proven by many years of careful research done by the Adventist Health Studies. And you can look that up um, under... Adventist Health Studies, even on the internet, you'll find it. There's an, a, a specific listing there. For, there are the hundreds of peer-reviewed scientific papers which have documented these findings, many of the studies funded by the United States government. As mentioned above, many young people say, I don't really care to add years to the end of my lives. I, you know, do I want to live for a long time some, in some nursing home and, uh, you know, and someone has to feed me and it's just... But that's not the years that you add when you take care of yourself. The years you add are those years in your midlife that are the most productive, the most exciting, the most fun. It just takes longer before you start deteriorating. So the best years that, uh, that you add are right in the middle. 
People who do not follow these guidelines begin to deteriorate in, in healthy years earlier than those who follow the guidelines. Are we prepared to deal with the changes that will inevitably affect us in this life? Are our preparations consistent with God's plan for our lives? So how many of those changes, think about we've, what we've talked about, marriage, children, old age, death. How many of those changes do we usually plan for? Maybe none. Maybe none. <laughs> I hope that wasn't the right answer. <laughs> oh, it wasn't the right answer, but it may be the truth. Well, usually we, we, we try to prepare for marriage, and we try to prepare for children. But how many of us prepare for old age? And how many of us prepare for death? Sometimes we have to, because it just comes upon us. I, I knew of a missionary one time, but unfortunately was bitten by a rabid dog and he didn't realize it. And then he started to develop rabies. And he knew that he had just a few days left. And his family gathered around and, I mean, what do you do under those circumstances? Just horrific situation, just horrific situation. So, I mean, and, and all of us, I mean, pretty much all of us recognize we ought to prepare for these every one of these major changes in our life. We, we should. We, that's a part of, of what we should do in life. And we should do that in light of what God has in, plan, has in mind for us. If we do what God wants us to do, our lives can be long and successful and, and happy. Uh, God never intended for any of us to be depressed or sad or anxious. God intended for us to live fulfilled, happy lives. And we could, if we, and we can, if we do what he asks and, and follow the, the diet recommendations, we follow the spiritual recommendations, we follow the Bible study, the prayer and so forth that he recommends all through the Bible. So our challenge for you out there is to think about what are the changes that you still face in life? What are the changes that you need to be prepared for? What are the changes that we all here need to, be cha need to be preparing ourselves for? Whether it's cancer, whether it's dying of something else, but that time is coming. And I hope that you've, in our discussion, you've heard something worth hearing. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you for these words of wisdom and, and, and descriptions of how we might better prepare ourselves for what's coming. We know that change is an absolutely unavoidable part of our lives. May we make the most of it with your assistance and your guidance is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.